in the IB psychology course, uh, you need to know about uh, techniques to study the brain. And one of those techniques is magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. So in this video, I'm going to explain how and why MRI is used to study the brain, how it's used in psychology. But let's first look at the IB guide. What do you need to know? The topic here is techniques used to study the brain in relation to behavior. And in the guidance, it says we can use one or more examples of a technological technique used to understand the brain and behavior. So this is different from you know, your research methods uh, or other types of techniques. We want to focus on technology. So I think MRI and fMRI are good examples to use. So what really, one of the, the key questions if you're writing about MRIs, if you want to revise and study MRIs for this exam question, uh, you want to know how and why they're used to study the brain in relation to behavior. And that phrase, in relation to behavior, is really essential. It's really key. And I think it's overlooked by a lot of students when they write about technology like MRI when we study the brain. And so that's what I'm going to focus on uh, in this video. So when we talk about how MRIs are used, you know, you, you could focus on, you know, the um, the, the summary of the magnetic, it's massive magnetic and the magnetic fields, what it does to the protons, uh, radio frequencies, how that produces image of the brain. But I, I don't think that's needed. I don't think it's uh, useful. I think you can write excellent answers without focusing on that um, technical detail of the mechanics of how an MRI is used. When I think of how and why the MRI is used, I'm looking at the research, the studies, right? How is it used in the particular psychological studies that you use in your course? And I think this is the better way to try and answer this question. And so if we look, I've taken four studies here that use MRI. Um, we've got the Iowa Gambling Task, SM's case study, Luby study on parenting, and Perry and Pollard study on neglect. These are four key studies that use an MRI. And what's, uh, I think, a good way to try and understand um, how and why they're used is we look at the relationship studied over here. And we can actually see some similarities with these. In the first two, we're looking at it's uh, studying the relationship is the brain affecting the behavior, decision making or fear damage. So the brain is going to affect those behaviors. That's the direction of the relationship. Whereas if we look at these two studies, even though these are correlational, so we can't really conclude that causal relationship, but we are hypothesizing a link here between the behavior, parenting and neglect and the brain, either the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. So I want to break down these two separate explanations for how and why MRI can be used. And I think knowing one of them in detail would be enough, um, especially for a short answer response, maybe for an essay, you could write about both. So let's have a look at the first example, how. Well, one way that MRI is used is we use MRI to find people that have damage to particular parts of the brain. Because the MRI can help us know the structure, shape, lesions, damage, provides similar to an x-ray image of the brain, we can see um, any abnormalities in the brain. So what we can do is we can find people that have damage to particular areas that we want to study, like the amygdala, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, um, the hippocampus. Right? And then, so we find these people with, with damage, and then they, they um, conduct tests to study the behavior. So, for example, the Iowa gambling task, they did the Iowa gambling task. That was a test that how they wanted to measure the behavior. SM's case study, they did lots of things like took her to a pet store, made her watch videos. So here we have, this is how the relationship study. MRI finds the damage and then we conduct tests to study the behavior. And we can see here it's the brain is identified as the variable causing a change. Now, why do we do it? So that's the how. That's the summary of the how it can be used to look at the relationship in this way. And why? Well, why it allows us to understand localization of function. By studying people with particular, by, by grouping those people with the damage to the same area of the brain, and then comparing them with a control group or more than one control group, we can draw conclusions about uh, the role of that behavior in the, in the um, sorry, the role of that part of the brain in the behaviors being measured. So for example, just to elaborate on that point, um, if we're saying if a damage to a particular area of the brain affects your ability to behave in a certain way, it's pretty logical to conclude that that part of the brain must have some function in that behavior. And if we think about the amygdala and fear, if we damage our amygdala, or for example, SM damages her amygdala um, and can't, doesn't have the ability to feel fear, logical to conclude that the amygdala must play some role in that behavior, the ability to feel fear. Similar with the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, if we damage our VMPFC, and we, that affects our ability to make decisions based on long-term consequences, logical to conclude then that one of the functions of the VMPFC must be to help us make decisions based on long-term consequences. And so this is, this is um, how MRIs can be used to understand localization of function. Now there's also another way that they're used. Um, that I introduced in the beginning. So we're looking at correlations between environmental factors and the brain. So here what we do is we're looking at people with different experiences. So maybe they have different levels of socioeconomic status, they've got different um, 
uh, experiences with meditation uh, or maybe um, for kids, you know, different levels of neglect. And then, so the, the three different types of studies just there. And then we use the MRI to actually measure um, the differences in their brain, so size and shape of their hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, uh, or other areas. And then we conduct correlations. So we see, we see does, is there a correlation between um, your socioeconomic status, for example, you know, how your, your lower, how little money you have um, with a particular uh, part of the brain? Or is there a correlation between how many hours you meditate and the growth of a particular area of the brain? Now, why do we do that? Well, this helps us understand neuroplasticity, that we can hypothesize that those experiences, those environmental factors are affecting the, those particular parts of the brain. Okay, and so the, what we're saying here is that if, if those different factors have a strong enough correlation, well, then we can, we can say maybe those factors could affect those parts of the brain. Now, it is important that we, we're saying they could and we're looking at correlations. These aren't causal relationships because we're not look, uh, controlling all the extraneous variables. We're just looking at correlations. And so, for example, socioeconomic status in the hippocampus. This has been correlated, right? Um, lower socioeconomic status is correlated with uh, smaller hippocampal development. The hypothesis here is that um, this is going to increase uh, high levels of stress for people in lower socioeconomic status because they've got more things to worry about. And that's going to increase levels of cortisol, which could treat the hippocampus. Um, neglect in the prefrontal cortex, again, correlated with, um, so the more neglect you suffer as a child, then the smaller your prefrontal cortex will be. So here we're looking at neuroplasticity, that these behaviors, or these environmental factors, and how they affect the brain. Now here are some more reasons why we can use MRI in these situations. One is that we're using human participants, we're not using animals. So in those correlational studies I just talked about, we can, we've, uh, and, and many psychologists have, tested those effects in a laboratory to deduce the causal relationship. They take a bunch of rats, and they put them in a deprived environment, or they put them in an enriched environment. Right, neglect or um, stimulation, and then they measure the difference in the brain, and we can say that you know we can draw the causal relationship there. But this is animals, this is rats. Can this apply to humans? So MRI allows us to study these relationships on humans. Same thing with damaging the brain. You know, um, we can take monkeys and we can damage their amygdala, and we can put them in different groups and measure the behavior. We can draw the causal relationship between damage to the amygdala and the ability to feel fear. But that's monkeys. Is that the same as humans? So MRI allows us to uh, conduct these uh, studies on human participants, and we can study the brain in this way. Something that this is why you know animal research was very, um, really useful in psychology in the early days before we had this technology. The other reason why is um, you know you wouldn't get many participants to sign up to get a part of their brain damaged, right? Human participants, they wouldn't do it, and so but we can still study these uh, parts of the brain without damaging anyone's. Um, hippocampus or without damaging their brain. And also, it, it, it could mean that we can develop technology so we don't need to um, harm animals anymore, right? And that would be good. We, we, animal research is still being used, but you know, maybe with advances in technology, this could be phased out. So uh, now if we look at some, what are some limitations of using an MRI? Well, one is that MRIs are limited because they can only tell us about the structure, the size and the shape. Uh, or, or you know particular lesions in the brain. We can't look at functional, the activity, what, you know, um, different parts of the brain that are active at different times. And that's why functional MRI is really useful because that can tell us different parts of the brain that are active at particular times. Um, when it comes to neuroplasticity, those examples I was talking about, again, we're looking there at correlation, not causation. And so, yes, we can hypothesize the links between those behaviors, but um, the behaviors in the brain but that's, that's correlational and they're just hypotheses. That's not causal. Now, we could say that that's actually not a limitation of the MRI, that's perhaps a limitation of the methodology, but I think it's a, a fair point to make. Another one, if we're looking at localization, um, we know from MRI study, fMRI studies that a behavior like fear isn't just the amygdala. The amygdala projects and connects to all the different other parts of the brain, like the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and other areas. So um, it's, it's a limited understanding to say that part of the brain effects, uh, causes that behavior, right? Behavior isn't necessarily localized in just one particular area. It's all about connections between different parts of the brain, which we can't really understand with the MRI by itself. Now, if you're asked a short answer question about this, um, here's how I would structure it. You have your introduction. In, in your central argument, you're going to explain how and why. How and why the MRI is used. And I would focus on one of those two examples I just talked about either in quasi-experiments where we're looking at the brain and how it might affect behavior, or looking at correlational studies where we correlate environmental factors with the development of the brain. I would focus on one.
uh, and then use one study su to support that and then your conclusion. So your introduction would just outline your central argument and the evidence you're going to use. That should be pretty straightforward. I doubt you'd be asked to talk about two techniques. Actually, you won't because the guide says one or more, so that's fine. <clears throat> now, in your essay, same thing. You'll be asked about one or more. So I, I think it's far better to have one in depth than to focus on two techniques superficially. Let's say you were asked to discuss the use of one or more uh, techniques used to study the brain. So again, you'd have it's basically a short answer response is how you'd begin. You'd have the same central argument, and you'd have the same. Uh, you'd have uh, two studies here, right? So you'd add a second study into um, demonstrating you know, the how and the why. One way you could do it, a, um, a different way, is to explain how both of those examples, so you could say how and why in quasi-experiments with the brain affecting, um, sorry, the brain affecting behavior and have a study and then talk about the limitation and then you could have the second way, uh, the correlational studies, how the environmental factors correlated with the brain and the study. And so this framework here is open to um, you know, different approaches but I think you can just Keep it real simple, central argument, how and why it's used, two supporting studies, and then you can't argue the limitations, and then your conclusion. Now you might be thinking, what if it's evaluate? What if it's evaluate the use of a, um, a technological technique? People that know me well enough by now are going to say, uh, know I'm going to say they're the same thing. Evaluate is strengths and limitations. Well, if you're explaining how and why and you're using studies, there are your strengths. Your limitations are, of course, your limitations. A discuss is a balanced review. If you're saying how and why, look at the positives, is an MRI great? But on the other hand, it's got these limitations. Balance. So it doesn't matter about the command term here if it's discuss or evaluate, which is the most likely command term you're going to get. You wouldn't get contrast two techniques because the guide says one or more. So you're allowed to just study one. You can't contra contrast one of anything. Now, just so you should be able to answer these basic questions. At the very least, you should be able to de describe some studies that use MRI. Right? That's the very minimal. But really what you want to be able to do is explain how and why the MRI is used to study the brain and behavior and making that link, right? explaining the relationship there between the brain and behavior and how the MRI allows us to understand that link. And you're either looking at neuroplasticity or localization of function. And then um, finally, if you're studying for the essay, if you want to write an essay about this, you'd be adding some limitations. All right, so this is all included in our quantitative research methods chapter. Um, I talk about MRI and fMRI. I think it's better to do less but in more detail. Um, so we've got five topics in this unit. This unit also, this uh, chapter six, also prepares you for paper three. So everything's in there. Um, teachers, we've got, the, I'll put all the links in the description here, but we've got the support pack. This has got unit plans, PowerPoints, um, videos, workbooks, everything you need to teach the unit. Uh, if you're using my book, this would be helpful. Even if you're not, um, download a free sample because you, you might find it useful anyway because these are all the topics that anyone has to teach regardless of, of what's in the rest of the course, what book you're using. So um, it may be, it may be useful. The link is in the description. Um, yeah, and then I'll, I'll, again, I'm putting all this in the revision guide. So I hope this was helpful. Um, it is pretty complex. You know, these explanations um, are not basic. They're complex, but these explanations, these, um, uh, yeah, these summaries are going to help you get a seven, right? These complex arguments that show a deep understanding is the difference between getting a five in IBC psychology and getting a seven. So, you know, do work hard to understand them. Alrighty, I hope that ha helped. Cheers.